Hi, everyone. Welcome back uh, to the second half of the afternoon session of the industry track. Uh, we've also got on screen Zenon. Uh, Zenon Capron is uh, the CEO um, of Capron Asia. Um, oh, sorry, he's the director of Capron Asia. My apologies. One of Asia's leading financial technology research and consulting firms. Uh, previously, he's held executive positions at Intel and Citigroup. He is really well regarded and recognized in the thought leadership space in the fintech uh, and financial institutions area and is regularly quoted in the press and on television. Uh, so Zenon will take us through a panel discussion um, on the future of financial institutions and fintech partnerships. Zenon, over to you. Great. Thank you, Akio. And thank you, everyone, for attending the session this afternoon. Uh, certainly the new normal that we've uh, encountered this year and, and glad to be part of API days. <clears throat> All the, the venue isn't as spectacular as it was last year. Right now you're in one of my bedrooms. So that'll have to do for the time being. Today's session is about uh, fintech and the cooperation between fintechs and the financial institutions. If we look back to the first time that fintech was really recognized within the financial industry in about 2014, 2015, it was seen very much as a winner take all game where fintechs were designed to eat the lunch of the financial institutions and the financial institutions would be nothing left uh, after, after the fintechs had taken most of the industry. What we've seen is kind of a, a, a different outcome. Uh, increasingly, fintech is about cooperation rather than competition. And APIs play a critical role in that. APIs serve as the way for individual fintechs to connect into financial institutions and to help the fi financial messaging and, and finances flow. Um, and in fact, facilitate that cooperation. Today's panel, we have a great lineup uh, of speakers that I'm sure you've looked at on the side on this. We do have a technical limitation on the platform of only having five people on the screen at once. So we are gonna be rotating some of the respondents in and out, some of the panelists in and out to uh, meet that. So hopefully that doesn't take too much away from um, the session today. But if you have any questions, please do ask them in the chat window and we'll try to get through as many of those as we can. Wanted to start off the session today with Thomas and Nauman. Um, Thomas from AXA and Nauman uh, from Standard Chartered are obviously sitting on the financial institution side of this equation. And so really what I wanted to do before we get started here, and, and maybe Nauman, I can come to you to start, is the present situation. I mean, when, when you think about more broadly cooperations with fintechs, what does that mean for Standard Chartered, for your institutions, and then how do APIs pay, play a role in that? Uh, thank you so much, Zenon. First of all, so excited to be part of this uh, this discussion here. Thank you so much for, for inviting. Yep, uh, in the current situation, or maybe taking a step back, I think APIs and this whole ecosystem and partnership are so important for us. Uh, that's the way all industries are, are working towards making sure they create best experience making sure they deliver more value to our customers than what they can do just being one institution by, by themselves, which means collaboration across institution, collaboration across fintechs, and, uh, and absolutely. So I think that's our key priority. Uh, we, 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 we have partnered a lot. I can give you several examples, maybe it's a quick one. Uh, for, for a bank like Strange Chartered, and we, 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 we call Singapore our home, ADM machine have been a have been a challenge for us that people want to dispense cash and how many places they can go and find our ATMs. So we partnered with one of uh, one of the the fintechs and with the power of APIs, uh, so cash, uh, we were able to give a service to our customers over thousand uh, uh, merchant points in within Singapore. So what was seen initially as a limitation becomes such a big opportunity for us. And A, with the partnership, as you, as you call, and secondly, power of technology, we were able to overcome that. So there, there are numerous examples, and, and we are so so excited about it, and uh, we are leveraging on, on all of that. In the current situation, that opens up even more opportunities and create even, 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 even bigger needs. That's a great point about the ATMs. I mean, I when I moved to Singapore a couple of years ago, I picked the bank based on where the ATM was and where the branch was close to my home. And I know for the foreign banks, that's a challenge to uh, to be able to um, compete with local banks on that on that aspect. So I can see where that really is a, an advantage. 
Thomas, let me come to you. I mean, for AXA, what what does what what does this new cooperation mean? I mean, on the maybe we speak a little bit more on the insurance side and 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 how APIs are having a role in that. Yes. Uh, so, thank you for for inviting uh, me to the to the panel and to to share the the perspective. So, when it comes to the APIs and uh, insurance, um, it's we are looking at this from the two. Uh, two-way perspective. One is a as a strategic investment to get access to more customers, because especially when you look at the strategic partnerships with large industry players, either telco, it might be airline, it might be um, uh, any type of the business that is very transactional and has access to the large customer base. The APIs today is, is uh, basically a table stakes to deliver the right level of the customer experience, like right level of product that starts with the identifying the risk, the pricing, and uh, uh, in many cases, embed the transaction with the other transaction. But as well as it's, uh, uh, we are seeing this as a way to address the long tail. And when we talk about the long tail, is all those smaller players, both on the startup scene, smaller distributors, but uh, in many cases, as well as our own agents, we are equipping them with the access to the APIs and capabilities that they can start building their own uh, participant either into marketplaces or starts uh, 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 using their own e-commerce capabilities to drive access. Because in the end, customer preference is, is one. It's very clear that customers prefer have a ability to research by their own and transact by their own. What is uh, So we want to equip every single participant in the value chain in ecosystem with the same capabilities. So that's why really the APIs is, is the glue. And uh, uh, to, in today's ecosystem, when you talk about the partnerships, both on the distribution, but as well on the servicing side, like claims in healthcare, it's uh, really table stake and, and uh, not anymore a, a discussion about we should do it or not. Um, and you can see it even at the board level, those are this uh, vocabulary of uh, talking about the APIs, API integration is, is a uh, normal normal thing. So it's, we, we moved a l very long way compared to where we were five, four years uh, years ago. Thomas, I want to follow up on that, that point uh, about the long tail and addressing the long tail. Can we talk about that a little bit more? I mean, what did that look like a couple of years ago and what does it look like today? How, how has that helped you to address the long tail specifically? So as you can imagine, when you have a picture of the of the industry, and and I'm talking because we are uh, we are a composite insurer, what we are dealing with with the partners both on the PNC side, but as well live side. And as you can imagine, if you have experience, it's very transactional and person to person business. So uh, initially, for the past, I would say for the first two years, it was very difficult to convince them that actually by providing them capabilities. Uh, they can enhance the business and it will not cannibalize their own uh, own relationship and will not undermine how they are uh, conducting business, building the relationship with the customer. But over the past two years, and of course we have seen this year a tremendous uh, pickup and increase in the interest of utilizing the tools and uh, having access directly to those APIs, I would say to productized API, set of APIs that we develop over time, it skyrockets. Mm -hmm. Literally during the CBE, Everyone was, was asking us, can I get uh, access even faster? And, and it took us close to three years to push for it. And even like like uh, like COVID accelerated this tremendously because it's it's uh, it was a matter of, of having a revenue or not having the revenue and uh, interacting with the customer when the physical contact was, was not possible. So that's that's a, I think it's a, one of the, the great examples that we that we have from this year. Yeah, especially in the, the the situation with COVID. I mean, we we were in the across Asia, moving digital as it was, but now you know even even faster than we were before, uh, with everything that's happened. Um, Nick, I want to come over to you. Uh, you know, your role at Thought Machine. I mean, you're seeing multiple different angles of the industry and multiple different businesses within the industry. Which which segments of the financial industry are most affected by APIs, and and are you seeing the biggest changes, both around cooperation and APIs between fintechs and financial institutions? 
Yeah, sure. And, and, and maybe I'm a little biased because my selection sample will be obviously the people that, um, <clears throat> that want to talk to us. But uh, mostly for us at the moment, I mean, we, for those that don't know, we're a, we're a cloud native, fully API enabled core. So uh, can operate across the banking uh, or across all the banking verticals. Most impact we're seeing at the moment is retail and SME. <laughs> Um, and, and I think, um, you know, COVID, is, as Thomas said earlier, COVID's, COVID's been an accelerator of that. And I think that banks have achieved things in the last six months that they perhaps had on their plans for, you know, two years, but suddenly were forced to do it and suddenly have realised that um, you know what 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 they are capable for of, and we're we we're, we're seeing we're, you know we we're, we're seeing that impact in the market. Do you, do you think, I mean, obviously COVID has put a new emphasis and prioritization on digitization. Do you think the industry is moving fast enough? Do you, do you think it's, it's moving too fast? I mean, the rate of adoption has obviously increased over the past six months, but is that slower than it should be anyways? Or? So, so I think it is, so I think it is slower, right? And, 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 and I think it's slower than it needs to be. I mean, and Anderson, years and years ago now said software is eating the world. And despite the billions of dollars that banks have spent on, on digitization over the last you know, 10 years, I, I would argue that, that, bank, that software has been eating banking you know, particularly slowly. In, in defense of that hypothesis, I would say, look at what software has done to you know, e-commerce has done to the high street, uh, Napster and Spotify did to music, et cetera, et cetera. Right? Bank hasn't had that that moment, although people have been, as you said earlier, um, announcing the death of banks for for ages. But I do think that 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 it has been eating banks slowly. I think it it, it still is to a certain extent. But I think the way that um, you know digital economics works, it, it was a um, oh, I can't remember. There's a fictional character who was asked. You know, how did you go bankrupt? And it was at first very slowly and then very fast, right? Uh, and, I, and that's what digital economics does. And then that is what's going to happen to banking at some point. Um, just because it was forecast 10 years ago and it didn't happen doesn't mean it's not going to happen. There's no reason that, that banking should miraculously be, you know, excused from the, the digital revolution. So I do think many banks are, are moving too slow. We've just done some primary research with, with IDC. Um, and I think it was something like 90 odd percent of, of banks in the region are still running on core technology that's, that's over 15, in some cases over 20 years old. So banks do have to get a sense of urgency around this, I think. Interesting. I'm going to stick with you, Nick, for, for a minute here. I mean, I, I, it's funny you talk about core systems. I started off my career at Citibank and I, I, was, I, I replaced a, a COBOL based uh, system with FlexCube uh, in 2003, so I'm, I'm I'm fully aware of the the tangled mess that legacy systems can uh, put on this. I mean, one of the things that strikes me about APIs in the financial industry. I mean, if we look at Europe, because Europe's had PSD2, which has kind of forced the issue of open banking and APIs there. It seems like the, there was a lot of discussion, a lot of hype around APIs and what it was going to do, but it seems like the resultant push onto APIs is a little bit slower than we might have expected. Do you, do you, would you agree or disagree with that statement? I, I would. And I think you, as you were sort of giving your background, I'm sure you're, you're still bearing the scars, you know, is, is the reason, right? For, for most incumbent banks, the, you know, larger banks, a core banking system will have 400, 500, 600 other systems wired to it and that wiring won't have been elegantly done through apis necessarily there might be bits of esb um and all sorts of, of of bits and pieces and and in fact banks have spent an awful lot of money over the last 10 years like uh, connecting that digital sort of lipstick if you like around their core faster and faster because that that monolithic legacy core doesn't suit the evolution that that the consumer on the street is, uh, has, expect, has been expecting. And rather than replace the core, because the legacy cores were all kind of the same, um, monolithic, you know, limited, all that sort of thing, then the, the smart thing to do was to wrap it in, in, other digital, in other digital lipstick. What that now means is banks have got enormously complex integration estates surrounding their cores. And when somebody says, okay, let's, let's you know, stick some APIs on it, uh, ain't that, Ain't that ain't that simple? I mean, it's going to take 
a fundamental re-architecting of the bank to be able to take full advantage of, you know, technology like ours, but but also, you know, that they truly take take advantage of APIs. Interesting. Uh, but I want to come to you in just a second. I mean, Nick, the 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 perspective that you, you put in there. I mean, I, I remember when we were working on that core transition, we had to move the apps or we had to inventory the apps and the apps turned out to be Excel spreadsheets with with formulas in it. That was very challenging. Uh, but I mean, transfer wise, you guys have, have worked with digital banks and with regular banks on on, on providing your services as well. I mean, what what have you seen been the biggest challenges working with uh, the traditional financial institutions is it that API readiness is is one of the biggest challenges? Yeah, it's a it's a great question and and super interesting to hear that just now. Um, so I think exactly what was just mentioned around getting banks ultimately ready to be able to easily integrate and seamlessly take on these APIs. So there's a lot of fundamental work behind the scenes that actually needs to be done to be able to take on these. API products that ultimately are the sexier version of whatever product they may have been running beforehand. And the way I kind of run a comparison is similar to like if you're building a house, right? You need to have a strong foundation on the house to be able to support all the nice features, the nice kitchen, the nice bathroom, or whatever you want to put in there. And it's it's similar to a bank in that sense. So if the foundation is not strong enough, if you integrate these APIs, the actual ability to wire them consistently and actually well and then ser service them efficiently becomes a challenge. So what we see in particular when working with a lot of the traditional players is they're having to go through that exercise right now. And it's not that the APIs are difficult to consume and it's not that they are complex or, or there's a lack of understanding on what the API actually does. It's more how do we fit that in there? And are we ready or as ready as we should be to be able to take on um, such, such aspects? So most of the challenges that we come across is, and, and you pointed to it, right? Moving slower than, than, we, than we want to. Um, but I think it's because the extent of the actual rework that needs to be done first has only really, really been realized now. Mm, interesting. Do you, I mean, when you're looking at banks to partner with both as a supplier and as as potentially liquidity provider, I mean, how high up does readiness to connect? I mean, because presumably there are some banks that you probably love to work with, but you can't because they're just not not ready. So is that part of your kind of selection criteria when you're looking at potential partnerships is, you know, yeah. readiness of the bank to connect? Yeah, um, absolutely. That is one thing. So like I would call it propensity to partner. And that in itself is there are other aspects aside from just the readiness from a technical side, but that would definitely be a major contribution. So we and why we see digital banks and the kind of rise of the challenge of banks moving faster is because they are integrated to cores like the thought machine, which enable them to actually build on this ecosystem quite easily. Mm -hmm. And from that standpoint, it's not because they're technically more equipped from a expertise or a knowledge standpoint. It's and you see them integrating these APIs in a matter of days and weeks rather than the more traditional banks, which can take years at times. It's just because they're set up from from, from the foundations really smoothly, and it's, it's it is that easy to take on an API once you're set up right. Interesting, Aki. I want to come to you next, but I mean, Abed, it seems like uh, you know the digitally native or digital first organizations are more equipped in, to to be able to handle this, especially as everything digitizes going forward in the future. Is yeah, that, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, Aki, does that does the conversation does that resonate with you? I mean, Bamboo in particular, you work with a lot of financial institutions. Uh, providing kind of robo-advisory services, uh, uh, robo-advisory as a service effectively. And does that resonate with you as well in terms of what you experience when you're working with banks? Yeah, although it's it's worth mentioning, we do work with uh, many other types of financial institutions. Um, you know, if, if you're working with say a small advisor broker that has maybe a staff of 20, then you know APIs rarely enter the discussion. It's more of really an outsourcing relationship in that sense, meaning that we are the whole tech team 
it's more like they've just got the business people, the advisors, mm -hmm. basically whatever they need to fulfill the you know regulatory duties of, of whatever financial service they're providing. But when it comes to like platforms, tech, uh, they're basically totally greenfield. So it's super different to then like a bank where, you know, they've got decades of legacy systems and COBOL uh, and everything and, and where it becomes really intricate to try to weave a solution in. I would say that um, what makes maybe what we do is slightly different from a lot of, say, like payments is that oftentimes this can be set on the side. So it, it can be initially set up standalone, which may, means like the, the integration burden is a lot less uh, in, in that sense. And I think that there's a sense in which like, hey, let's set something aside standalone. So for example, a bank might choose not to custodize internally at all, just out of convenience because they don't have those APIs. They can just choose like a headless custodian that has all the capabilities set up and they're fine to pay the fees uh, and maybe they'll just kind of consider if this really takes off, we really start getting volumes, then we'll sort of revisit like, hey, how much of this should we internalize and kind of optimize the fee structure and, and so on. So I, I think, <laughs> ironically, even though, you know, digital wealth management or robo advisory has been around 10 years, it honestly still feels like it's early days. Uh, you know, I've been in uh, tech for 20 years now. Um, and I used to think, you know, like, of course, you know, things are going to change quickly and stuff, but it's, it, it kind of doesn't, you know, you can sort of see very gradually how even within fintech say like, yeah, things like you mentioned, PSD2, open banking are slowly creeping their way through, like sort of two years ago, nobody was talking about APIs, uh, here in Singapore, or Asia. So, you know, that's just kind of a new thing now. And, and I think mm -hmm. The, the big banks here are going through the first motions because let's face it, like most of them are still adopting cloud. You know, there's like, they're behind the curve. And, and so we often, when you just kind of read all the FinTech media, you get the sense that everything's already done because, you know, like a Revolut or TransferWise already have all the good stuff. But the reality is like 99% don't have it. And then there's like half who haven't even heard of it because they're operating like they were still operating like 1995 or something. So, uh, yeah, I, I think there's like several realities. Um, but the fun part of Bamboo, I guess, is like we, we sort of get to see both ends of the spectrum and you just have to deal with both in different ways. So I think we still see promise with APIs, but because of the slow transition to actual like open API implementation at scale, um, you know, probably in the near term, I think actually software as a service is going to be a bigger play where mm -hmm. it's, you know, potentially even bigger institutions like banks, they just say like, give me the whole package. I don't want to waste time integrating, you know, I've still have so much to do on the core. Uh, let's just get, get it kind of get the revenue flowing, if you will. And then let's do the tech properly, you know, later down the line. So more focus, I think, on the benefits, more focus, I guess, on the user, the use case, uh, which might be healthy. You know, let's, let's focus on the tech. So that's, that's, I think, how we see it now. Yeah, almost a sage approach. I want to stick with you, Aki, but I also want to ask this question, Nick. So Nick, you can come on as well. I mean, Aki, you kind of pointed at, I mean, we, we mentioned PSD2, you talked about regulations. I mean, in Asia, we're seeing kind of a bifurcated approach to open banking APIs. Uh, one, you have the regulator-driven approach. So like in uh, Australia, as an example, just a couple of months ago, I think it's the consumer CDR, consumer date, data rights, where under the auspices of consumers and customers having better control of their data, there has to be now APIs in place from all of the traditional financial institutions. Whereas here in Singapore, it's more, uh, you know, the government through Apex, the platform that's been that's been set up to kind of an API exchange, and through encouragement, you know, you have banks like DBS that have a published list of 100 APIs, but it's it's much more market driven. Aki, start with you on this, but where do you think the sweet spot is? Do you do you think it needs to be a forced like a PSD2 or um, what's happening in Australia, or do you think market driven? I mean, it seems like the outcomes are are slightly different in in both of these markets. Yeah, I do think if if we just look at it from a point of view of do, do we want the existing players, mainly the banks, to adopt open APIs, then the, the former basically forced adoption is far better. And, and you've seen that, I think, in the UK, that even though there was some you know, initial resistance and slowness, 
like they, you know they're they're at least at the minimum level uh, for the most part. So like that happened in again sort of the the digital transformation timescales happen actually shockingly quickly. Uh, so it's pretty amazing in some sense that that was able to to take place. So I, I do think if if we're interested in kind of getting the banks uh, to that level, I think really forced adoption is is best because here mm -hmm. I think compared to some other markets, the banks dominate the value chain more so uh, even. So they they manufacture and distribute a lot of products. So you know they're very vertical in that sense. So there doesn't seem that much maybe to to gain from from an API play because it's like, well, we're taking care of our own business, you know, like what what do we why would we want to open this to other people? So it becomes a bit of more of an innovation play right now, I feel. But where it may become interesting is, of course, when the tech guys like the Razors, this digital banking thing really takes off, uh, grab, spices things up because, you know, then the banks are more in this position of, do you go for the dumb pipes play, which I think in the Asian context is unlikely because they are so verticalized, or do they go more the route of, hey, we're the product providers to the new distributors, which are then the, the tech giants. And I think that's mm -hmm. where... Probably, you know, the guy, the likes of a DBS who who have been still relatively early adopters in terms of all tech. Same for OCBC. I think they're going to be better positioned if push comes to shove. There, like, who's going to get you know the grab distribution or the get grab products? Um, so I I would look out for those. Yeah, that's that's interesting. That that push the push versus pull. Um, Men, I, I guess, approach this. And I mean, if you look at markets around the world, it tends to be three to five banks hold 80 to 90% of the retail deposits. And that's certainly the case here in Singapore as well. And, you know, when you have that much market control, you're, you're potentially a little bit loath to move quickly on some of these other things that may endanger some of that business. Uh, Nick, I want to come to you. I mean, does is what Aki said about the adoption. I mean, would you agree with that in terms of the approach from a regulatory perspective? Should it be market driven or should it be a kind of forced adoption? I, I think it's got to be both, right? I mean, I, I think if you if you try to, you know, if the government tried to kind of uh, legislate innovation, then that that would go the way uh, a, a lot of uh, bureaucracy does. It just it just gums up the works, but. If you've got regulators like MAS, like APRA in Australia and those kind of things, who are who are saying to the large, the dominant forces, you, you know, we are going to force you to do this for the good of the consumer and for the good of competition, but we are not going to tell you exactly how to do it. We'll leave that to the market. I, I think that's the that's the right way to do it. Um, and I think it's important because although people talk about, you know, the banks are dominant and the banks are, you know, big and the and, and they're, you know, keeping control. I mean, if you look at the 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 this the arguments that are going on in the US over the moment at the moment with with Facebook, you know, Google, Apple, those kind of things, exactly the same as in the same in the tech space. So as tech as a as a as a startup, as a tech innovator, and you know, like like uh, Bamboo and and a whole bunch of others, unless the government does step in and say, "Hey, there needs to be some form of, of level playing field," then that you know that doesn't then then consumer demand doesn't automatically get mean that people like us get to play. Right? I mean, we may still get shut out by by you know the the, the larger the larger organizations the dominant tech ones so it does need to be both both push and pull and that ultimately ends up i believe you know benefiting the consumer benefiting smes fintechs all that sort of thing and then ultimately if they do it right it benefits the large banks as well yeah yeah that does make sense i mean it it can be a win-win opportunity. Um, Nick, I want to ask you a follow-up question. Maybe I'll ask the same thing to Thomas in just a second. But uh, Nick, I mean, where 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 do you think it's going right? Um, I mean, it can be globally, but more specifically here in Asia. I mean, where do you see the approach to APIs and open banking and kind of this fintech collaboration? Wh which markets really stand out in your mind of where it's successful? So I, so I think there's, there's, there's a couple of that. I, so I was impressed with the Australian 
uh, that they, uh, the Australian regulator, they did CDR instead of just open banking. So the consumer data rights is is so much more broad than banking. Sure, they've started with banking, but it will expand, extend into you know energy and telco and and you know a, a whole bunch of areas that I don't think even you know the government particularly knows how it's going to go. But they knew they needed to open up more than the banking. So I think that was I think that was really really smart. I think. I think MAS, you know, with things like Apex, I mean, all right, some people will look at Apex and say, oh, I didn't quite take off the way it should. But but, but it was absolutely, you know, it was a brave, proactive thing to do. Um, and just because it hasn't, you know, may, may not quite have sort of got off the end of the runway yet doesn't mean it's, it's not going to as the, as the rest of the market, as the rest of the market ca- catches up. So, you know, I, I think... Different different regulators. There there are different you know pluses in every in a variety of different areas, and and there's no there's no perfect answer. What I would say though is if I look at neo banking around the world, I think there's a lack of innovation there. Mm. I mean, where a lot the where there are lots of fintechs like. You know, TransferWise and, and Mambu and Bamboo and, and and Mambu, who are a competitive arts and all that sort of thing. You know, there is real there is real ambition and there's real innovation and people are going after it. A lot of the neo banks just look like the big ones, but with a you know neon coloured card and a maybe a slightly cool app and and they're using their supposed savings on. Uh, of no branch network to to sort of give higher interest rates or something like that. That, that for me isn't really innovating around the, the product or the business model or all those kind of things. So I think also we need to see, uh, you know, we need to, we, we you know we we the startups have you know have a responsibility to to, to innovate and, and jump on things as well. Just just because you're a neo bank or a startup doesn't immediately mean that you're you're an innovator. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. And the, the, it'd be interesting to see here in Asia as those digital banks come to market. I mean, um, you kind of pointed at that before is, is what what kind of innovation will they fo- force in the market, if any? I mean, if it's if it's just copying kind of what we're seeing globally right now, I don't know if that's going to move the needle much for many of the people here in terms of what they're looking for. But if they really, truly offer innovative services, um, you know, I, I, I use the example of China. I lived there for 14 years yeah. and I went through the whole Alipay revolution. And initially, foreigners could invest using that UFL product. And it was amazing because it was, you know, for as little as one renminbi, so the equivalent of kind of 20 US cents, you were able to invest and you were able to earn money uh, that would be, you know, starting the next day and you could take your money out and it'd be back in your bank account within a couple of hours. So it really democratized wealth management. And so, you know, you see now with Grab launching their auto invest product, um, be interesting to see how that that evolves um, in the banking space. Thomas, I want to come to you kind of around the insurance side of things. I mean, insurance maybe uh, doesn't get as much attention from the, the the sexy digital bank perspective, you know, from the digital insurance perspective. You know, we've seen digital insurers in in places like China with Zhongan uh, uh, famously having, you know, many policies, all very small value, but many policies on there. Um, you know, within the insurance space, I mean, how, how do you see that, that, that original question that I had, had pointed to Nick in terms of what needs to be the driver is it the regulators or the market that's going to kind of open up the market and 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 force this innovation so I've, we need to consider this this problem from two perspectives because uh one area that's that is actually missing to 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 uh, you know to reach the tipping point is the standardization and it's in many other industries when we went through the revolution from the internet from the telco and so on it's it's really the point where there was agreement on the standardization and people started to talk the same language. They managed to build on top of it, uh, the value on top of it. And here, I think the regulators really have a important, uh, important, uh, important uh, role because otherwise the competitors, they don't have incentive. It's all boils down to the incentive. Do I have incentive to play the game? And unless there is a standardization, everyone needs to play. That's this is the the, uh, the the point where regulators need to come in, and it comes from the things like data portability, definition domains of the data, but as well as things like forcing the the industry to agree on the the API uh, specs. If you look from the where 
where the value and the, where the push versus uh, pull. So it's right now it's very clear. The market, if you look on differential services, and let's take example of uh, insurance, it's it's not a it's a uh, industry with the uh, high barriers for entry. So it's especially from the regulation point point of view, uh, capital intensive. Uh, but as well as the uh, as well as the processes that are uh, well shelt uh, sheltering the uh, the industry. On the other hand, really customer wants increased access, convenience, uh, better value for money, and transparency. So this is a driver that is pushing a lot of those uh, in innovations in the insurance market. And as you rightly pointed, it's you have example of Zongan, but as well Pingan, that is traditional insurance that transformed itself to the the real uh, the biggest insure tech uh, uh, globally that is are able to hone in into the customer problem, look at the accessibility which was in many cases was the uh, access to the customer is is one of the first boundaries how can i distribute a simple product very simple to to understand it's not bundled up with 10000 things with a low barrier for entry from the cost perspective and uh, reach uh, reach the masses because this is as well how you educate the customers and you bring them on board to the uh, to the services and you start building on on base of this you can start building the ecosystem and move to the platform and ecosystem approach where you you part them from the distribution, but as well the value delivery, and healthcare is is, is I think is the, the biggest growth area for for uh, insurance as industry right now because this is what is happening now. Integrating insurance to the health healthcare uh, solutions to move into the prevention. It's not only paying claims, but really to be part of it. And and we're gonna see much more things happening. And already we see the uh, we are seeing the incumbents. Um, in Asia, many uh, many incumbents are investing into healthcare, but we're gonna, we see exactly the same in in other markets: Brazil, uh, China, and and other emerging markets, uh, even markets like um, like Nigeria or or Morocco, where there's a clear need from the under uh, under insurance perspective. Interesting. Now, I mean, I mean, all of the discussion so far has been very positive about. APIs and open banking. I, I want to hear something negative. I want to hear, you know, is, is this keeping you up at night, or are you, are you positive about the adoption of APIs and 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 what it means for Standard Charter? I mean, are are you worried that it would take away any of your business? Absolutely, then, and we are excited to to. I mean, if you if you look at Standard Charter, we recently announced that we are launching. Uh, a new banking as a service platform in Indonesia, where we'll be able to offer uh, small retail products, loans, deposits, and all that, uh, which is banking as a service, uh, white label, and could be used by any e-commerce player or, or or any social media player over there. So, look, we we are we are ready with all the tools. We are ready with with rich 160 year old uh, history of banking. We understand risk. We understand what banking is. We know that we are in prosperity business and how really we can help customers uh, go uh, grow there uh, and, and become more prosperous. So, no, absolutely. We, we, are, we are looking at it as an opportunity uh, that mm, how can we collaborate with several other industries and offer our expertise, both in terms of, of banking as a service, as well as uh, managing the risk and all that. So, so I mean, Oh, I mean, talking about those partnerships. I mean, Standard Chartered has uh, what SC Ventures, right? Is the is kind of the the well one of the ways that the bank integrates with fintechs and identifies fintechs. Um, is, is that do you have other vehicles that you use to kind of identify the fintechs and and companies that you're working with, or is that the primary focus? Maybe you could talk a little bit about what it is as well uh, for people who aren't aware of it. No, so so uh, absolutely. I think SC Venture is our leading innovation arm, and they actively work with with all potential partners, and and and, and keep doing. We, we've done hundreds of of POCs, and then of course, then we, we we nail it, then we we scale it as well. And Nexus, what I just spoke about, is 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 one of SC Venture's product we are we are we are launching as well. Um, and uh, if you look at it, we we been into other. Uh, mega initiatives like we announced our digital bank uh, with a brand of of Mox in uh, in Hong Kong. Uh, mm -hmm. That's another. It's 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 a purely partnership play. Uh, we'll be working with leading partners in, in in Hong Kong in the in the telco space and in other leading areas. 
and and yeah, uh, collaborating. So I think we'll be working on all models, whether these are uh, small partnerships, just and then scale up, and at the same time, large strategic partnerships, uh, which can have uh, which can have very very interesting robust offering for for our customers across the globe. Mm, interesting. And, and across those partnerships, I mean, uh, let's talk a little bit about what you feel is missing. I mean, within the API space, is is there something that's missing right now that would be very useful uh, either for the fintechs or for a standard charter? Is, is there some gap in in the offering or, or in this? I mean, before we mentioned the standards uh, would be useful to have anything beyond that that comes to mind that would be uh, something that's missing? Um, look, at, I, th I think it's a journey right and uh, and and there have been very good progress and if we, if we talk about Singapore here so the the main API use case we we, we are partner uh, uh, with MAS and, and several other banks uh, financial play uh, financial uh, planning display services so again I think it's it's one of the key use cases for Singapore and, and perhaps amongst the one the few ones uh, the the first ones to to be rolled out as well there are discussions around data exchanges there are discussion around authentication as part of one transaction how to make it seamless i think eventually it comes down to creating working together and creating really nice experience for the customers uh, and 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 adding that value so yeah it, it's a journey uh, we picked up a few use cases during that that a lot of uh, discussion points come up but but i think we're able to 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 solve them uh, and 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 move ahead yeah, but it's a long way. I think we need to create a lot more opportunities. Uh, but as I said, it, it's a journey which uh, we, we have happily part of it. Mm, indeed. Uh, Nick, I want to come to you on this as well. But Amin, maybe I can I can ask a follow-up. I, I want to talk a little bit more about the future. I mean, what is the what is the thing that you, you expect over the next couple of years that that people may not be thinking about? What is what is the the iceberg in the, the industry? when we talk about APIs that, that nobody's paying attention to? So I think um, I think the iceberg analogies, um, uh, it, is, it is nice. Somebody, I was talking to somebody the other day, they came up with a nice analysis that said, you know, a lot of these neobanks were meant to be the iceberg to the incumbent Titanic, and they've turned out to be ice cubes in the, in the gin and tonic sort of thing. Um, but, but I think that is going to, I think that is going to change, right? I mean, I think, you're 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 seeing the sorts of money that that that, that the banks and and the the effort and the strategic intent and the executive bandwidth that 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 banks like SCB are investing in, in you know in 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 moving into this digital transformation and 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 trying to get their head around APIs and how best to use it and partnering with um, with, with fintechs. I mean, I, I would say they're probably most nervous about. A, a China type event uh, about you know Google or Apple or, or Grab or you know Grab Singtel or something like that making a move that they suddenly find they're disintermediated from their their customers and they 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 become the you know at worst uh, dumb pipes as as as, uh, as was said earlier I I mean I think it is just going to be it's going to be more embedded banking, right? It's mm -hmm. going to be at the moment. You and I, as you, as you were saying earlier on, you you know, you came in and you grab. You don't even think about it. It just gets charged against your account. You don't need to worry about it. I mean, I think that will just happen more and more. I think the lifestyle banking is where it's going to get. Now, I know a lot of people are talking about it, and not a lot's happening at the moment. But I, it's, but I think that you know that also is the technology like cloud and API becoming more and more mainstream, the big banks really throwing some muscle behind it, realizing they need to work with partners. Um, and, and you know, it, the acceleration will come, that, that, that digital economic cliff that I talked about, where all of a sudden um, the world, the banking world has changed. You know, mm -hmm. it happened very, very slowly, and then it will happen very, very fast. And I think it is, you know, in, embedded finance. Yeah. Yeah, that embedded finance. I mean, certainly when you, I mean, the, the best example is yeah, Uber or Grab, where you you're making payment. Well, not these days so much, but it, when we could travel, that was that was one of the ways. Um, stay with us just for a second. Sure. Nick, I have a, kind of a follow up question on that, and and then Abed, I wouldn't want to ask you kind of around the same lines. But Nick, I mean, you seem to have strong opinions about the digital banks. And I think when you when you look at a market, I mean, just because this event is kind of a, a, a what well, was here in Singapore last year, and and 
in theory, at some point this year, the licenses will be awarded to the digital banks here in Singapore. What do you think is the secret sauce of the banks that are going to be winning here in Singapore, the digital banks? What do they need to offer to be enough of a differentiation that's sustainable? Yeah. Awesome. Beyond the metal cards, the metal, the pink metal cards, uh, you know, what else do they need to offer? Yeah. I mean, I, so, so um, there's a guy called Ron Shevlin in, in the US who's a, an industry commentator who I just love reading. He's got a really nice sort of snarky style, um, but, but really insightful. And he, he wrote an article a while ago now that said, Neobank, are you an alternative or an accessory? And, and I think a lot of the digital banks around the world are accessories, right? They're a fashion accessory. I'll throw a few hundred bucks in a month. I'll use your app. I'll, I'll have your, your metal card and all that sort of thing. And then at the same time, something else cooler comes along. I'll, I'll use something. I'll, I'll, I'll jump to that. But in the meantime, mm -hmm. I'll leave my mortgage and my loans and, and my investments and all that sort of thing with the boring bank that, you know, I, I, supposedly, I, I supposedly hate. So I think the next wave of neobanks, if they really are going to make an impact, and, and you look at Grab Singtel, you, you, look at, um, you look at the match moves, you look at, at, at those, kind of, uh, those kind of folks, and, and you think they, they, they've got to come, and I think they will come with something that, you know, more di something different, something that really does make them an alternative, something that makes me as an individual think, yep, I'm going to close all my accounts in the big bank and I'm going to go across there because it genuinely does something different for me as a whole, not just a cool app and I, you know, and I, and I get a bright pink card. Yeah. No, that's true. I, Abed, I want to come to you on this. I mean, arguably, TransferWise has come from a slightly different direction where, you, where you've offered, you know, a, a particular product and kind of expanded beyond that. And 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 to be honest, I mean, I, we use your product and, and it almost goes to what Nick was saying about shutting down our regular bank account and just using TransferWise. Unfortunately, you're not in Hong Kong yet. But um, I mean, does that does that echo with uh, how, how much of an emphasis was that for TransferWise? Uh, you know, working on kind of a very fundamental challenge and then expanding from there. And then notably, I mean, it, yourselves and a couple of other players passed on applying for the, the digital banking licenses in Asia for large part. Does that, do you, do you feel you can still execute without that? Is that, is that important to the strategy at all? Yeah, so I think it's a, it's a good point. I think on the, on the, on the focus on making sure this is your product that ultimately satisfies all your needs and you don't need other solutions. So it, it does indeed um, solve your full, I guess, cross-border requirement. We're blessed, obviously, from our standpoint to have 2,200 people plus at TransferWise focused on one problem. Um, and when you have that many people aligned to a mission that is in incredibly focused on ultimately solving one particular problem, you, you get a long way to solving that problem. And we don't say that we've solved the entire problem. We still think we're only like 1% of the way there, but making the right moves and we'll keep ourselves aligned to staying on that path. Because it, it is a big enough issue. Um, it's interesting what like, um, Nick's comments on the kind of the neo banks and, and the second wave having to probably offer a more encompassing product that allows you to switch away from your traditional bank. But I, 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 I do somewhat agree with parts of it, but I also, do you think they've made traditional banks and these larger players wake up a bit as well? So we you know, we work with banks obviously globally as well, and we hear a very common theme of challenges, and that is customer churn. People are moving and people are switching. And even if it was a simple transaction account, and that's the only thing that Neobank offers, and it doesn't include savings, investments, loans, or anything else just yet, that in itself is enough for it to have switched. And that, that's quite a telling and powerful message in that sense, right? Kind of goes to the point of how far behind the curve some of the traditional players are. And don't get me wrong, there are some out there who are above, beyond, and there's a spectrum of how far behind their curve or getting closer to the curve you are. But they've done enough to firstly capture the customer's attention because people are switching and you're seeing some numbers and the rate at which these new banks are growing and accounts are being opened. It is, you know, it's impressive. And it does show that there is a clear signal for something to change. What they will get better at doing, and 
this is again going back to the whole i guess theme of the panel which is around partnerships and you don't need to go and build all your products yourselves so you know digital banks work with transferwise because they need an fx solution do they want to go and spend the next two three four years building their own no like they within a couple of weeks and and through this api they get that access straight away and if they follow that mindset and continue along that way they'll build the best in class ecosystem and then that's very difficult to come back from how do you then compete against that well you actually don't need to compete and go around and you know the traditional mindset is okay i'll have to go and build this myself again and do it better and you take two three more years but then the neo banks are moving even faster at that rate so what you're seeing is the traditional players needing to partner as well just as much yeah it's really interesting well, uh, you know, thank you to all the panelists. We're unfortunately uh, out of out of time for this panel, but I think we covered quite a bit in this. I mean, the the one comment that I would make that that seems kind of fitting, and somebody explained to me this um, a couple of years ago, is here in Singapore. Uh, you know, traditionally, Singtel owned all of the 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 cellular infrastructure and the fiber cable in the ground, and then that was um, eventually passed over to the government, and it became a utility. Uh, and now Singtel and the rest of the uh, telcos lease uh, that that those cables and bandwidth on that those networks off of the government. So it'll be interesting to see what happens in the financial industry if if uh, you know we we continue down this path and and banks stay relevant and uh, you know have a place in this ecosystem or if other players come in and the banks just become utilities. So uh, again, thank you for the panel and thank you for the organizers for having us here today. I'll pass it back to Akil for the next session. Cool. Thank you so much, Zenit.